today we are happy to have our own Christian Schnell to talk about the Poch theory and Lagrangian vibrations. Let's go, huh? Huh? Okay, thank you. Um, wait, why are you clapping? I haven't started speaking yet. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah, so I. Uh, let's see, I don't see Theo, but so, I mean, Theo asked me if I wanted to give a talk, so thanks very much to him, but also to the other people who organized the colloquium. Okay, so my topic is Is this one, so Hodge theory and Lagrangian vibrations. Um, I got interested in this topic as a consequence of this Hyperkeda workshop that's been running, that Ludmilla and other people have been organizing. So I'm kind of grateful to Ludmilla for, for helping to run it. Um, I'm talking about this topic because at the moment I'm very excited about it and I got the advice that you should always talk about the thing that you're most excited about. So that's, anyway. Um, so in particular I want to there are some very beautiful uh, conjectures that sort of talk about the Hodge theory of Lagrangian vibrations on holomorphic symplectic varieties. And so I want to at least introduce some of those things, okay? So by way of introduction, I will start with a compact case. So the introduction is the compact case. Uh, in this compact case, there are not going to be any Lagrangian vibrations. Okay, this will just be compact hyper manifolds, but I just want to sort of illustrate the general phenomenon, okay? All right, so, so X will be a, a compact Keller manifold. Have some Keller form a, omega. And then I want to assume that X is holomorphic symplectic, right? So, uh, so I'm, I will assume that I have some holomorphic form, a holomorphic two form on X, that's a symplectic form. So this should be holomorphic. And then I want it to be non-degenerate. Okay, and so non-degenerate means that, um, so I'm always going to talk about these sheaves here, but so what it means is it gives an isomorphism between the tangent sheaf and the sheaf of one forms, right? By, by contractions. If I have any tangent vector, I can contract, any holomorphic tangent vector, I can contract with this to make a one form and I want that to be an isomorphism. So this kind of thing is called holomorphic symplectic. That's why you uh, yeah, and right, and then in particular, the compact Kähler will mean, mean make this closed, right? But I want Kähler so that I can do Hodge theory, basically. Um, so just a small comment, um, under these assumptions, it's known that actually X is then hyper Kähler. Right, so by, um, by Yao's theorem, you can find a special kind of Kähler metric that makes this into a hyper Kähler manifold. So it means that you have three complex structures, i, j, and k, and the Kähler metric is kind of compatible with all of them, and it is that kind of special structure. Okay. Um, and so now let me, look, let me look at the Hodge theory, right? So we have the Hodge decomposition. Uh, on cohomology, so I get HK of XC is the sum of these HPQ spaces. Oh, I guess it's not enough space. Is K. And I can also think of these spaces as cohomology of the forms, right? So this HPQ is equivalently isomorphic to HQ of X omega PX. Okay, and then um, let me say right away, sort of, the, the key idea of this whole thing and the, one, the idea that I want to illustrate by this compact example is that when you have those two things together, the Kähler form and this symplectic form, it gives you lots of interesting symmetries. Okay, so the key idea will be this, that sigma and omega together give some unexpected symmetries. Okay, that's the that's general principle. So the first kind of symmetry is something I hope everyone knows. It's just hard left sheds, right, coming from the Kähler form. So the, the, first, the first thing that I have in this case is um, 
if I, I do something like this, so I take cohomology in some degree like this, below the middle dimension, then I can take a cup product with the Keller form a certain number of times, and then I go in degree above the middle dimension, and this is an isomorphism. Right? So this is hard left shots. That's if you want a, a reasonably deep fact, right? There's some analysis behind it. But okay, we know that that's true. Um, so that means you go to it. Oh yeah, yes, I should, that's right. I should have said this here, right? So th this implies that the dimension of x is some even number, which is 2n, is even. And my n will be this number, right? So that the degree 2n is the middle dimension in cohomology. Okay? So if I, if I go and I, so I arrange the, uh, these HPQ spaces in this usual Hodge diamond, Right, so you put the H00 down here, you put the H2N0 here, and the H2N2N all the way up here. Then this height left shits theorem is a symmetry around this, uh, <laughs> around this line <laughs> somehow. Uh, there's also no eraser, so okay. Let's try to get this a little bit nicer. Maybe like this. Okay? It's, so, the, so this is, um, you get this symmetry around this axis here by, um, by, the, by omega, by the Keller form. Right? Um, but now the thing is, because of the symplectic form, I have an extra symmetry. So, uh, so I have to write that over here. So the, um, the symplectic form actually gives me an isomorphism on the level of these bundles. between forms in degree n minus p and forms in degree n plus p. Again, by wedging with the symplectic form p times. Right? This is a consequence of this non-degeneracy there. And so now here, if I take cohomology, then you see that the, this space in the Hodge decomposition with a fixed q here will be isomorphic to the space uh, where I just changed the first index. Right? So this isomorphism gives me this extra symmetry here. And in terms of this picture, oh my, no, this is a really crooked picture. Is there an eraser, actually? It's in the right there. Yeah. Oh, here, yeah, OK, thanks. I guess I should fix it a little bit. Uh, <laughs> talk about being a geometer. <laughs> OK, so how does this look like? So it should be more like this, right, maybe. So we have this symmetry here. And so that, what that thing does is it just flips the P. Right? So it's a symmetry, if you want, around this, around this axis here. Right? So this whole diagram is not just symmetric around this horizontal line, but also around this slanted line. OK. Um, now, so this is kind of the, the, the general phenomenon, these sorts of symmetries, right? Now, if you look at this picture, um, can you tell what sort of group these reflections generate? See, I, I have the reflection around this line, and I have the reflection around this line. What do they generate? Dihedral group. Which group? Dihedral. Dihedral group, right? Like D4, D8, or something like that. I mean, the symmetries of that square. Now, this dihedral group, this D4, it happens to be a Weyl group, right? Do you know which Lie algebra it's the Weyl group of? It's not that I know this kind of stuff, I prepared it, so. <laughs> so does anyone know? D4? No? Sasha? So, SO4? SO5, actually, yeah, SO5, right. Exactly. So those two symmetries, they generate this D4. D4 happens to be the Weyl group of SO5. And indeed, what happens is that actually SO5 acts on the cohomology, right? So actually, this is sort of an, an illustration of the fact that uh, so this, this Lie algebra SO5 actually acts on the total cohomology of X. 
And this decomposition into these HPQs is actually just the decomposition into weight spaces. Right, this, is our, this has rank two, so the, it has two different a decomposition into two weight spaces with bigrading, and the Hodge decomposition is actually that decomposition. Okay? Okay, any questions on this example? Okay, so this is supposed to, to show this general idea that usually on usual manifolds you just have one kind of symmetry, now you have the symplectic form, it gives you an extra symmetry, and then you get some somewhat unexpected things. Okay, so having shown that in this example, now I want to get to the actual class of examples that I'm interested in, which is the, mostly the non-compact case. Okay, so from now on I really, I'm going to talk about these Lagrangian vibrations. Uh, Christian, you mentioned earlier the yeah, yes. so yes. that means that you can choose a special Taylor form. Yes, yes. Does that also give you any yes. information? Yeah, exactly, right? So this fact that SO5 acts on the cohomology instead of just the usual SL2, that was proved by Verbitsky first. And the way Verbitsky proved this is he says, take that hyperkähler metric, you have these three different complex structures, you can do harmonic forms that are simultaneously harmonic for all of them. And then you get different left sheds operators, and all of them together, they generate SO5. So his proof actually uses the hyperkähler metric. Okay, but you can get away from that by just using more Right. Like you, you can't, I, I think maybe it's hard to show that it's, you, would, you would get SO5, but at least you can see these two sort of reflections. So there's an yeah. implication here that, mm -hmm. that this is hyperkähler, but the converse is probably uh, No, I think they're, I think they're probably equivalent. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I can see how to get how to get a trivial canonical bundle there. Right. Power right. Sigma. Right. Um, no, the, the thing is, so I just say this in parentheses because in the non-compact case you don't have metrics, so I, I so have to get away from arguments with metrics. Right. That's that's kind of the point. Okay. All right. So now let me introduce the the actual sort of main object. So I will uh, I will have M which will now just be a, a Kähler manifold. Again, uh, dimension M is 2N. And again, I want it to be holomorphic symplectic, so again, I'll take a... You always mean complex dimension. Uh, yeah, right. I'll take a holomorphic symplectic form. And now this time, um, this, this thing, it may be non-compact, right? So maybe non-compact. Is it complete or not? No. And there isn't a metric, right, mind you. So there isn't, there's not going to be any sort of metric around. So this thing is, is really just some, some Kähler manifold. But it's not, I mean, you can still talk about a complete Kähler manifold without talking about the metric. You're saying that you're not even... I'm, no, I don't, I don't assume anything like that. So I'm not really doing analysis, right? <laughs> Yeah. You're going to stick with this, or are you going to put more conditions on it? I'm going, to, I'm going to put some conditions on it, yes, but not so many, okay? So I want this. So one condition I'm going to put is I want the symplectic form to be closed. That's a standard condition because it's true in the compact case, but here it wouldn't be forced, right? So I will assume that this symplectic form is closed. And so it does give a, a cohomology class. And then the substitute for the compactness is going to be that I, I take a Lagrangian vibration. Um, so, I will want to look at a, a Lagrangian vibration. So this will be a holomorphic mapping. I'll call pi to some base manifold B. So where B is a, is a complex manifold of dimension N. And then pi is proper and holomorphic. And lastly, I want the fibers to be Lagrangian, okay? So what I want to happen is that when I take, the, when I take a general smooth fiber of this M, and I, uh, of this pi, and I restrict the symplectic form to it, I want to get zero. So pi is Lagrangian in the sense that, so if, uh, if M sub B 
is a general smooth fiber, uh, just a, a smooth fiber, not general. Then the symplectic form restricts to zero on it. Okay? So, so you really mean pull it back by the inclusion? Yes. Uh, not just restriction, pointwise. Uh, yeah, right. So, so it means that, uh, you know, if you think of the tangent spaces to the fiber, the tangent spaces are supposed to be isotropic or something like that, meaning take any two tangent vectors along the fiber, stick them into a symplectic form, you get zero, right? That's what it means. And you're allowing the vibration to not be a vibration, but to have singular fibers? Uh, yes, right. And the, the interesting point will be exactly that this can have singular fibers. The typical fiber is smooth and it's a very simple structure, but the interest is in the singular fibers. Okay. You will say why it is an analog of compact? Uh, well, you, you will see, I think. I mean, the analog for compactness is that, you know, in a compact case, the situation is that there aren't all that many examples that people know. This is a famously sort of, a subject famously poor in examples. The only thing is sort of K3 surfaces, stuff derived from K3 surfaces. Um, and, but even there, in the compact case, one way that you could try to study an abstract hyperkähler manifold would be to say, somehow find one of these Lagrangian vibrations and hope to understand the geometry of M, of M through that vibration. And I'm just kind of doing this sort of locally, where I don't assume it's... Properness already some, some step towards compactness? Yeah, you, you will see. So the properness is something that will let me do some Hodge theory. That's right. Without, without that, you couldn't do anything. Right. Um, any other, are there other questions? Okay, so the thing is, uh, I will give this one, I mean, it's not really my, my field, right, because I got interested in this only quite recently, but I will give you this one example. Um, uh, so the kind of motivating example for this is this Hitchin vibration. This is the, the reason why you want to do non-compact things. So just very briefly, the way this looks like is that you have this moduli space, which maps to some affine space. So this is the this is the moduli space of of semi-stable Higgs bundles on this curve C. Um, N and D are the rank of the Higgs bundle and the degree on the curve. Higgs bundle is like a, a vector bundle yeah. with what? With the section? So, I, so a Higgs bundle means you have a vector field on the curve, and then you have this, this endomorphism that goes from the vector bundle to one forms on the curve times the vector bundle. That is, is sort of like what's left from a connection if you kind of get rid of the derivative part of it. Yeah. So it's this sort of data that this space is parameterizing, right? And it's known by various people's work that this, uh, this is symplectic, of dimension 2n, there's a natural proper map to some affine space, which is some, some kind of characteristic polynomial type of function. And people are very interested in this, in this map, right? So this shows up in, very famously in, in that proof of the fundamental lemma by Go. It shows up in that p equals w conjecture that Mark and other people have been working on. It shows up in non-abelian Hodge theory and geometric Lang lens and so on. So this is kind of an interesting subject. Right, and this is this is a sort of famous example where the space that you're interested in is not compact. It has this proper map, but the whole thing is not compact. And I guess technically, so it fits in this, it fits in this setup when n d equals one, when the G C D is one. That's the case when the space is actually smooth. If the G C D is not one, it's singular, then you probably have to do something else. But uh, it will apply in this case. Yeah, so a Higgs bundle is a vector bundle on the curve of a certain rank n, and the, on, on this curve C, right? So C is this curve of genus at least two. Um, and then a, a Higgs bundle is a vector bundle. A Higgs field is this map from the bundle to one forms in the bundle, on the bundle. And, you know, semi-stability is some condition on sub-bundles of this bundle, how they behave. And then this, this Higgs, uh, this um, Hitchin vibration, what it does is sort of pointwise, you think of this as an endomorphism of the fiber of the bundle, 
and you take the characteristic polynomial and the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, roughly speaking. So, but I mean, the, right, the geometry of this is very interesting for many questions about curves. And so, as far as I understand. Uh, okay, are there other questions? So, uh, let me just add one thing here. Well, no, that's why I did here. So, what is known is that about these things. So, semi stable, uh, it means that if you have a sub bundle of it that's fixed by this Higgs field, yep. then you want to. If you have a sub bundle of this bundle that's stable by the Higgs field, then you want the rank over the, or the degree over the rank to be smaller than that of the, of the whole bundle. It's some condition to weed out bad, bad points in this moduli space somehow. Okay, so very quickly about these Lagrangian vibrations. So what is known is that the smooth fibers are all abelian varieties, right? So the smooth fibers of pi, I, I'll go back to this general setting. So the smooth fibers MB are abelian varieties. So they're actually, the fiber is actually projective. Um, all fibers, including the singular ones, have dimension n. Okay, so this is by a, a theorem by Matsushita. Now you're talking about general? Or no, the, the general case. This uh, example ends here. <laughs> yes, I, I'm just interested in the general case. Um, but then the singular fibers are sort of mysterious. Like you don't really know what the singular fibers are. In, when n is 1, you're doing a surface over a curve. You can kind of classify them, but in higher dimensions you cannot. Right? So the sort of picture is if you want, if this is the base B, then if you're at a smooth point, you get a nice kind of abelian variety. But if you go to a singular point, then you get God knows what, some, some stuff. Right? And so the idea is to, say, to try and say something about the singular fiber sort of indirectly. Okay. Uh, right. So the, the setup is, is the setup clear? Can you remember all the data? So we have this M mapping to B, and then the main players are the, the symplectic form sigma and the Keller form omega. Right? Omega, I think, standard notation, the sigma is okay. For symplectic, you just picked you just picked some Keller form now. Yeah, I just picked one exactly, but yeah, well you you'll see what comes in. Okay, uh, and so what I'm right, what I'm interested in is the cohomology of the fibers, right? So of the fibers. So again, I repeat that cohomology of the fibers, there's nothing interesting going on at the smooth fibers. They are just compact complex tori, abelian varieties, right? You know exactly what the cohomology is. The tricky thing is what happens at the singular fibers. Um, and so since they're singular fibers, the natural thing to do is uh, to use this um, decomposition theorem in this language of perverse sheaves, because that's the way that you study things with singular fibers. Okay, so we use this, we use the decomposition theorem. So there again, so there's a tiny bit of notation. So what you do is uh, you take this constant, constant sheaf on M. So this is the thing that would compute the cohomology on M. And then I, uh, you map it down to the base B by this map. So this is roughly take the cohomology along the fibers, right? And then the decomposition theorem says that this splits into a sum of objects PI, which actually run from, I runs from minus N to N where the pi are perverse sheaves. So there are certain perverse sheaves on B. And I put a little footnote here. So the little footnote is no shifts. So there's, uh, I mean, most of the algebraic geometers told me that they're not coming, so I don't worry so much about that, but um, there is a little thing going on with that this sort of stuff don't worry about it, but it's happening in some kind of derived category. Everything is really like some sort of complex of things. It gets shifted back and forth in some ways. I'm just going to not write all of these things because it just it doesn't matter anyway. Okay, so I mean, don't show this to your friend who work to your friends who work in perverse sheaves because it will look all wrong. But <laughs> it gives the gist, I hope. Um, 
Okay? And so the way you think about these PIs is over the smooth locus, they're just computing the cohomology of the fibers. Right? So on, on the smooth locus, on the locus, on the set B0 where pi is smooth, where pi is submersive, this is just the cohomology of the fiber. So this PI is just our local system. And the fiber of PI at some point is just the cohomology in degree n plus i of the fiber. OK? Notice that I, so the indexing is so that uh, it's, everything is sort of symmetric around 0. Right? That's one thing to keep in mind. So here, when I write PI, it's not the ith cohomology of the fiber, but it's the middle dimension, the fiber dimension plus i. So i equals 0 would be the, the nth cohomology of the fibers and so on. Okay? And then the, th the thing of this decomposition theorem is that these PIs, they somehow know in some way about the cohomology of the singular fibers. Uh, but I mean, then, okay, we don't really know what the PIs look like. Right? This is a sort of general formalism that gives us these PIs. The general theory says if you want to understand the singular fibers, look at these gadgets. But since we don't understand the singular fibers yet, of course, we can't say explicitly what these PIs are. We can just say over the smooth locus what they are. Okay, now I'm going to list two, a few small properties. So uh, the PI is non zero only in this range when i is between minus n and n. This is because. Uh, this is a q, sorry. So, so it means that just the constant local system on, on M, right? The, the thing that at every point just gives you one copy of Q on the total space. And if you computed the cohomology of this Q, it would compute for you the cohomology of M. Right? So this kind of decomposes the cohomology of M using this proper map. That's how that's what it does. But, sorry, but yeah. the PI actually, I, if it is perverse, it's completely determined by its by what it is on the open set. So it's an um, immediate extension of the top. No, unfortunately not. So what happens in the decomposition theorem is that each of these PIs has a sort of generic part that's determined by what is on the open set, but it could have also some part that lives entirely inside the singular locus, and that I wouldn't be able to see from the from the from the um, open set, right? Yes. Okay, so because all the fibers have dimension n, they can only be non-zero in this range. And then, you know, generically, the, the rank of this pi is, you know, it's the dimension of the cohomology. I mean, this is the Abelian variety, right, generically. So I know what the rank is, right? It's, the dimension is n, so that it's 2n, choose the degree of the cohomology. Right, that's what it looks like. And then also, the, the non-trivial fact is the so-called relative hard left shed theorem. That actually, the, they are symmetric. So you have an isomorphism between P minus I and PI, which is basically induced by the Keller form. OK, so you get some, some sort of symmetry out of. Uh, again, this is a very non-trivial fact, but fortunately, people have the gods who came before us proved it, right? So we don't have to worry about it. Um, okay, and so now the starting point for this, for this half, really, for this, for this part is, um, there are some very interesting, very curious coincidences, if you, uh, if you think about this. You yes. No, no, that's, that's it. I'm fine. Right, so I used to say, if I had given this talk last year, I would have had to say, let me assume that this map pi is projective. Because it used to be that when you want to use the decomposition theorem, you had to, it had to, you had to work in some algebraic setting. Now, fortunately, Takuro Mochizuki has written a long paper in which he extends the decomposition theorem to the Kähler case. So now one can just, yeah. Now one can just do the Kähler case. No, just properness of the map. The fibers have to be complete, right? But in not, a way, not in the other direction. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's some curious, curious uh, similarities, if you want. Namely, 
If I don't look at these guys, but in, there's another set of objects that look very similar. Namely, if I look at the forms on M, right? If I look at these gadgets, the bundles of forms on M, again, I have forms in degrees 0 up until 2n. So if I index it in this kind of symmetric way, they can be non-zero only when k is between minus n and n. Right? The, the sheaf of the forms on, on there. Also, when these are vector bundles, right? the rank of this guy, of the sheaf of forms, is, well, this is the n plus kth wedge power of the omega 1. Omega 1 has rank 2n, because it's a 2n dimensional manifold. So this has rank 2n choose n plus k which is exactly the same as the number over there. And then, <laughs> lastly, we also have some kind of hard left shits thing, right? Because the symplectic form gives us, uh, gives us this isomorphism between omega n minus k and omega n plus k by the symplectic form to the power k. Okay, so like all the properties that you have for these cohomologies along the fibers somehow magically also happen for the forms on the total space. Okay, that's the that's a mystery. What is this notation omega sub m? Um, so this is this omega sub m. So for example, omega one m means the sections of the of the cotangent bundle, right? Okay. Sections of the. And then omega 2 is the sections of wedge 2 of it, and so on. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, ex exactly. So this is holomorphic forms. Right. Other questions? Good? OK. So. These are Sort of, right. So this is. Uh, I mean, there, there's a kind of proposal for trying to explain the similarity, um, and it came out of an attempt by two people to sort of understand this P equals W stuff, which is in a compact case, but to understand it in a kind of more sheath theoretic local way. Yeah, but it, it's the same sort of similarity, right? You have some holomorphic stuff uh, and some perverse sheath stuff, and they seem to be related in some way, or maybe. I mean, the question is, are they related, really? So you're saying the holomorphic forms of the total space of a Lagrangian vibration mm -hmm. have a structure similar yes. to this? Yes. 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 Structure. Yes. Yes. And with the symplectic form, sort of playing the role that the Kähler form plays, right, in these isomorphisms. Um, Sounds like mirror symmetry. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we'll let's see. We'll see. Um, so, right, okay, so there is a proposal, some kind of proposal for, for how to start, at least start explaining this, and um, this is due to Shen and Yin, so from last year. Um, okay, so this is Jun Lang Shen, I think he's been here a couple of times, and Chi Chen Yin. Um, so what their, what their suggestion is, is so, you know, you want to relate these things and uh, well, the first problem is that these sheaves of forms are on the total space M, and those perverse sheaves are on the base. So how to relate them, right? And so what, what their suggestion is, so uh, look, at certain, look at certain complexes of sheaves. So, so there will be a small detour, but then you'll see how it relates them on B. So these will be uh, coherent sheaves. Uh, so, um, I will just write the notation for them, so they will be called GIK. If you need to know what they are, well, they are this thing. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter so much. So actually, each of these perverse sheaves has some holomorphic object attached to it called a D module. And that D module has some extra data, namely some kind of filtration. And what you're doing is, uh, you look at graded pieces with respect to that filtration. So in, anyway, in this way, out of this perverse sheaf, you can cook up some complex of sheaves on the base, okay, on the space B. And again, these are non-zero only in the range when both I and K are between minus N and N. And then what, what their proposal is, is the following. So they're proposing that these complexes should have some symmetry. Okay? 
So th the proposal by those two guys is, is this conjecture here uh, by uh, Shen and Yin. So I'd, I'll give you, I, you know, let me write this. I'll give a little bit of uh, what they actually look like, these things, okay? I mean, without being too technical, but. So their proposal is that these things are symmetric in the two indices. Okay, that's the conjecture. But that doesn't make any sense at this point because I haven't really quite told you what they are and so on. But I'll try to explain what the evidence for it is. And then I think you'll hopefully get convinced that this makes sense. But let me first say some general thing, okay? So the general thing is uh, from the decomposition theorem and the cyto theory with these Hodge modules, what you actually get is that you can, you can relate the sheaf of forms to these complexes in the following way. So uh, if I take these complexes, these GIKs, and I sum them up over the first index, the I is the index for the PI, so that's the same index as in the decomposition theorem, right? This is the index that goes the cohomology of the fibers. If I add them up in this way, then I don't, of course I still get an object down on B, but I get something that I can also compute from the sheaf of forms, okay? So at the same time, when you prove the decomposition theorem, you get this kind of identity out, out for free. Okay? And then uh, on the other hand, if I look at the direct sum, where I sum them the other way around, so I just, I'm just going to flip the indices and just sum over the second index, then these are all the guys where, where, this, um, where the first index is fixed. So these are all the things that are coming from, from just PK. Right, so this, this is just comes from PK. Okay? So this, I mean, this conjecture is a sort of indirect relation between these two things. It's saying, take the sheaf of forms on M, push it down to B to get an object on B, and then the object that you get can be, is isomorphic to some object that you can compute purely from this PK. So it doesn't directly relate them, but it relates two derived sort of object, objects to each other. Okay? I'll give all the known evidence for it, and hopefully uh, then you'll see kind of why it's an interesting statement. Um, this thing. Okay, so the evidence. Uh, so the first one is, it's, it holds on the level of cohomology. So when B is compact, if B is compact, then it makes sense to take cohomology, and then the cohomology of these complexes are the same. Okay, so this is something that they prove in their paper where, this where they make the conjecture. In the compact case, you can relate the cohomology of these GIKs to the cohomology and to certain Hodge numbers up on M. And then you can use the symmetries in the Hodge numbers of M to, to get this. Uh, the second thing is, um, is, the, is sort of the, the edge case when one of, oh, yes, please. In the conjecture, yes. B is smooth, assuming. Yeah, B, well, uh, I guess not necessarily, but I guess no, I technically no, but I mean, in my talk I will assume it's smooth just to make it easier to think about it. Does that, hmm? having a Lagrangian vibration over a compact base, doesn't that force the base to be very limited in what it can be? People conjecture that it's Pn in the compact case, but I, don't, I think it's not known at the moment. But there's some theorems about some, many times that it is, right? Right, when, the base, when it's compact and smooth, then it's Pn, right? That's Wang's theorem, right, right. Yes, uh, other questions? Well, okay. Um, so if I, if I look at the, the, the borderline case where I take n, right? So for example, uh, i equals n, right? So what happens in that case is that um, you can actually say explicitly what these complexes are, uh, hka, hkn. So this, um, the, uh, the H and K actually turns out to be just the sheaf of K forms on the base. 
Okay. Uh, so here, when I when I write G and K, this is really the top cohomology along the fibers. So then, you know, the, co the coefficients are, I guess, completely trivial. And then this just picks up some information along the base. And on the other hand, the GKN G out of Saito's thing, you will get that this is related to the, uh, the cohomology of the sheaf O, the structure sheaf OM along the fibers. Right, so this is, this is basically related to the H01 of the fibers, right? Or the H0K of the fibers. Right? And so the special case of this conjecture is a very nice theorem by Matsushita, again, that um, says that those two things are isomorphic. So the RK pi lower star OM is actually isomorphic to omega KM. Okay? So in this particular case, when one of the indices is N, the symmetry does hold. But it's an interesting symmetry, right? It's not a, not a trivial thing. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, so in particular, see, it says, um, for example, the one forms on the base are isomorphic to the H01s along the fiber, right? So, for example, if I, so, um, it, this says that the cotangent space at a point P, at a smooth point, is isomorphic to uh, the H01 of the fiber, or in other words, the H, H1 of the structure sheaf. Right, so this is the H01 of the fiber. Right, this, and along the smooth fibers, that's what that's saying. Uh, what was the key idea? What? Does anyone remember the key idea? There's so many keys here. Oh, too many keys. Here. Sorry, maybe I just say it too often. So the key idea earlier was you get interesting symmetries out of the symplectic form and the, holom and the Kähler form together, right? So let me illustrate it one more time by kind of saying how this isomorphism works, okay, in this Matsushita theorem. So the way it works is that, so um, again, maybe here, let me draw this. So here's the base B, here's a point. So let's say I take a little one form, a, a holomor like a cotangent vector or a holomorphic form uh, at this point, right? So this beta is a, I'm just gonna write it sort of like this. So it's a little locally defined holomorphic form, right? I claim that I can convert it into a zero one form on the total space. And what I can do is, so I can pull back that form, then I get a holomorphic, a little holomorphic form upstairs. And then I can convert it into a tangent vector field by the symplectic form, right? So the symplectic form says that this is equal to the symplectic form and then evaluated on some tangent vector field, where this C is a, C is a holomorphic vector field. on M. Okay, so I didn't leave much space here, but so if M is here, here's a fiber over that point, I get some vector field, and actually the vector field is forced to be tangent to the fibers, right? So the fact that this form restricts trivially to the fibers, and the fact that the fibers are maximal isotropic subspaces because of the Lagrangian condition, this means that this vector field has to be tangent to the fibers. This is because of the symplectic form, right? And then once I have this vector, yes. Well, it yes, ex except that it sort of doesn't make sense to say tangent to the fibers. But since the total space is smooth, the vector field lives even in the neighborhood of the singular fibers. Yes. But it'll morally be tangent. And it will morally be tangent to them. Exactly. And then if you move along, it means the right. singularities don't change as you move along. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it gives you a stratum. Maybe. Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Okay, and now I can convert it to a vector field, uh, to a, a zero one form by the Kähler form, right? So now if I, now I can make a vector, uh, a zero one form by sticking it into the Kähler form, right? And this will be a, this will be a, a zero one form on M, which actually will be closed, okay? So in this way, you see, you can convert forms down in the base 
into uh, forms of, of the sort of conjugate type up on the total space by using both the symplectic form and the Keller form. And so this is kind of how this isomorphism works, right? Okay, anyway. Uh, and then so the, the last bit of evidence that I wanted to say about this is that on the smooth locus of pi, the thing that I was calling B0, the two complexes really are isomorphic. So the complexes are the complexes GIK and GKI are really the same. Isomorphic. And really isomorphic sort of term by term. Right? And the reason for this is so the smooth fibers are just abelian varieties, right? So then on the smooth locus, I get these Hodge bundles. Uh, that I'll write VPQ. So these are the bundles that compute the HPQs of the fibers, right? And by this sort of argument, the, the 0, 1 bundle is just isomorphic to uh, the omega 1 on the smooth locus. And the 1, 0 bundle is dual to it, so this is isomorphic to the tangent bundle of the, on the smooth locus. And then because the fibers are abelian varieties, I know the HPQs, right? The, all the HPQs, they're just wedge powers of these things. So then the VPQ is actually just the pth wedge of the tangent sheaf, tensor the qth wedge of the omega 1. So it's actually just wedge P TP0 times the sheaf of Q forms. Okay, on the smooth locus, everything's really easy because the fibers have really very simple geometry. And so with this, I can, uh, I can tell you what these complexes are in that case. Um, yeah. Here, and you, if you want a global D bar closed form, you yes. get a Kähler. But if you had a form, if you just had Kähler fibers, but not yes. global yes. Kähler form, do you still get useful information? Yeah, then I would only get that it's closed along the fibers. That's the... That isn't, isn't quite enough, but to see, because then we have the singular fibers, right? I mean, the point of Matsushita's theorem that I'm just erasing is that this doesn't just hold over the smooth locus, this holds including over the singular locus, right? Yeah. So that's. Um... Okay, so let me write this sort of next to the next smaller case. So. Uh, I'm going to write g k n minus 1 and g n minus 1 k. Uh, so they're actual complexes with two terms in this case. Uh, so this is, um, let's see, omega n minus 1 v0 times this bundle of forms in degree n k. And then uh, you have some connection and you go to omega n v times v n minus 1 k plus 1, I think. And for the other complex, it works the other way around. So you get omega b0 k times v n, n minus 1. And then omega b0 k plus 1 times v n minus 1 n. OK? On the locus where you have a variation of Hodge structure, you can explicitly write these things down. Sorry, what's this? Very easy. This, uh, this is this Gauss-Mannian connection where you differentiate uh, by, by transport along the fibers, but you just take the graded quotients of it. Sorry. Okay. And so since I know that the fibers are abelian varieties, I have this nice description of the Hodge bundle. So if I stick that into it, you see what you get is that this thing will be, for example, omega n minus 1 b0 times wedge n tb0 times omega k. B0. And then down here you get omega k b0 times wedge n t b0 wedge omega n minus 1 b0. And then you see that those two things match magically. Uh, you have to swap those two terms, but they do match, right? And in fact, in their paper, they, in their paper they compute all of them, they show that they all match, and you can in fact, you can make an isomorphism sort of term-wise 
that really commutes with all the differential stuff. So they're really isomorphic as complexes. Okay. Uh, it's a complete mystery why these things should be isomorphic over the singular locus. Because you know all the stuff that we know about the geometry is just on the smooth locus. On the singular locus, we don't know zilch, what it looks like. We don't know that these complexes don't have some parts that lives entirely inside the singular locus and all of that. Okay, so it's a very big sort of inspired guess to guess from the smooth case that this should hold in general. But that's the evidence all from the smooth case. That's the the evidence plus Matsushita. I mean, Matsushita is the is the one case where it holds over the singular fibers, right? But I mean, yeah, it's a very inspired conjecture, I think. All right, and so now in the last few minutes, I want to give a sort of um, give some sort of bit more structure to it. So uh, I don't know how to say this. Maybe uh, give a good explanation at least for why why this makes sense for the symmetry. Okay. Um, an explanation for the symmetry. Um, and so the explanation is, okay, what is the key idea? Does anyone remember the key idea? Use the two structures. Use the two structures, exactly. So see, one structure is, I do have, by, by relative height ledge shifts, I have the symmetry in the I index, right? I know that minus I and I go to each other under the, using the Keller form. So the, the what the Keller form does for me in terms of these complexes is it gives me a map from GIK to GI plus 2, K plus 1. This is roughly, you know, because this is the index, the cohomology along the fibers. This is just increasing the fiber cohomology by 2. It's just cup product with the Keller form on the fibers. And you have this relative hard left sheds, right? So relative hard left sheds says that if I go from G minus IK to GIK plus I by omega to the I, then that's an isomorphism, right? Okay, now I observe, based on this key idea, that the symplectic form actually also acts on these things, um, but in a slightly different way. So the symplectic form actually gives you a map that only increases the first degree by one, not by two. Now you can ask, well, why should that be? Because the symplectic form is closed. It's a cohomology class in degree two. It should also increase the degree by two. Right, along the fibers. But it doesn't because the symplectic form is trivial on the fibers. So along the fiber direction, the symplectic form doesn't act at all. It acts sort of partly in the fiber direction and partly in the base direction. This is why you only increase the index by one in the fiber direction and you increase it by an extra one compared to this one in the base direction. Okay? And then, Wait, so yes? That means you're not quite looking at the forms of the total space. Um, you are, but see, the, the thing is that these complexes, they really involve both stuff along the fibers and along the base because of this whole formalism. And so actually, the symplectic form can, can act on stuff, but it doesn't literally just act along the fibers. It re these complexes remember also what happens when you move away from a fiber, and the symplectic form acts in a sort of mixed way. Yeah. And okay, so then the thing that would explain the symmetry very nicely and that I want to conclude with is a conjecture that you might call symplectic relative height left sheds. Symplectic relative height left sheds. And it simply says that the symplectic form should behave the same way. So if I look at gi minus k, I act by the symplectic form k times to go to gi plus k k this should be an isomorphism, right? Okay, and now I will explain in the last couple of, the last half of the couple of minutes, um, and I, how this leads to a very nice picture where you can see the symmetry, okay? So, um, so maybe I'll write this over here. So you get a nice picture. Um, but it's not a Hodge diamond sort of picture. Um, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take the GIKs, but I plot them on this sort of hexagonal grid. Okay, I'm going to draw this in a second. But 
So I'm going to have a, a cube root of unity. And then I'm going to put the gik at the position k plus i times this cube root of unity. Then it'll make some sort of hexagonal shape, right? Let's see if I can draw that. Uh, something like this. Uh, okay, my. That maybe makes this sort of shape, huh? roughly speaking. Okay, so um, the g minus n minus n will go down here. The g n n will go up here. The g n zero will go up here. G zero n will go here. G zero minus n will go here, and g minus n zero will go here. Right. And so I, I sort of plot them on this on this hexagonal grid. I mean, you see that then. They're sort of naturally indexed by i and k, so you might think, well, I should plot them in some sort of square grid. But it, it looks nice if you plot it like this. And one reason is because um, these gik's, the, the condition for it to be non-zero are i is less than n, k is less than n, but also you can show that i minus k has to be less or equal to n. So there's sort of really three conditions that squeeze it from all three sides. And so because of these conditions, if I plot them in this sort of way, they really make this nice hexagonal grid. Right? And then those two um, sigmas and omegas, in terms of this grid, the way they act is like this. So if this is a part of the grid, omega moves you up by two steps, and sigma moves you across in this sort of slanted way. Okay, so here you go, this is the point with coordinates i, k. Here you go up to i plus 2, k plus 1. And here you go to i plus 1, k plus 2 with that indexing, okay? And so the usual relative height left sheds, in terms of this hexagon, um, it's the symmetry along this line, right? So this symmetry is relative height left sheds for omega around this axis. And my sim- Why is i go to i plus one? I, uh, under sigma, under six, yeah, so the, what you would expect first, if you take a two form, and you take cup product with a two form, you should increase the degree along the fibers by two, right? So hi should go to hi plus two. But the symplectic form is trivial on the fibers, so that part is zero. And then it, it moves sort of partly along. Fiber is Q with respect Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay, so let me say it again. So for the hard left shits thing, this symmetry between i and minus i becomes the symmetry along this line, right? This, this diagonal. And my <coughs> symplectic relative height left sheds will be the symmetry along this line. So this would be symplectic relative height left sheds. Uh, you're right. Thanks, Tor. <laughs> You're correct, because it goes this way, yeah? so it should be this line, yes. Very correct. This is the symplectic relative height left sheds. Okay? Now, same question as before. These two reflections, which group do they generate? You see that? What? I have, these, I have this hexagon and I have these two reflections in these diagonals. Which group do, they, do these two reflections generate? You see it? No, actually not, because yeah, I don't. I don't have the reflection along the middle oh, line, right? Twice. Uh, oh, three. Yeah. Rotation by what? Six See it? No. So you just get S three. While group of A two. That's that's right. Yes. Yeah. So you just get a. You could just get S three, but in particular, these two reflections together, from those, you can generate this reflection here, right? And this reflection is the reflection that interchanges gik and gki. So the symmetry is sort of the symmetry be between gik and gki would be explained very nicely if, in addition to the relative height left sheds for the Kala form, I had the symplectic relative height left sheds, because then I can get this reflection by just composing the other reflections. 
right? And like Sasha is saying, so this group, this S3, happens to be the bio group of, of uh, SL3. Uh, and it seems very likely to me that actually omega and sigma together will generate some kind of action of SL3, but again, I guess that would be another sort of conjecture. So, um, okay, right, so I, I hope you get a bit of an overview of this, of this conjecture at least, so thanks for listening. So you, you can, there's also some Hodge theory you can have, even if the fibers are non-compact, mm -hmm. if, you, if you do kind of log the Hodge theory, like, I don't know, remove a smooth divisor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it, is it interesting at all? It probably, you'll have to ask the experts. I mean, probably yes, but, you know, I... I mean, for this sort of decomposition theorem and so on, just to talk about all that in properness somewhere, right? And so I would expect that if there is anything, it will be much, 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 much more complicated, presumably very hard to state. I prefer to take the really complicated technical statements, leave them to other people, just think about the more basic ones. There is, so there, there may be, but I mean, the tricky thing with this decomposition theorem is that it only really works in the proper case, right? This sort of quote unquote purity is. Yeah. So that's the, yeah. So the compact case you had, uh, the dihedral group of order four, and then the compact right. case yeah. you get mm -hmm. the dihedral group of order three, I mean, three dihedral right. group of order right. three. Right. Right. Right, and so then, if I may say this, what should happen in case you're wondering is that in the compact case, if you have a Lagrangian vibration, you will get S, not SO5, but SO6. Oh. And SO6 is, I think, the same as SL4. Oh. Right, and so then this SL3 would live inside of that SL4, sort of. I think that should be the sort of relation, but. Oh. I mean, I don't know, this, this Lie, Lie algebra mysticism is not my. Compact yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right. Right. Any more questions? Oh, this, thank you.